chapter 6. The book of Psalms. We'll be looking at chapter 6 together. So turn with me there. Let's read Psalm 6 together. Psalm 6, to the choir master with stringed instruments, according to the Sheminith, a psalm of David. O Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am languishing. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are troubled. My soul also is greatly troubled, but you, O Lord, how long? Turn, O Lord, deliver my life. Save me for the sake of your steadfast love. For in death there is no resemblance of you in Sheol who will give you praise. I am weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with my weeping. My eye wastes away because of grief. It grows weak because of all my foes. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. For the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my plea. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies shall be ashamed and greatly troubled. They shall turn back and be put to shame in a moment. So far our reading from God's Word. May He add its blessing to our hearts this evening. Well, uh, in 1505 there was a night, maybe, or a day, something like this one, maybe even worse, where there was... Uh, much rain and, and thunder. And there was a, a young German man walking through a field. You know who I'm talking about, I'm sure, Martin Luther. And he's walking through this field uh, on his way back to school after being told by his father that he was not to uh, cease his, his study of law. And uh, he was overtaken by a thunderstorm so severe that this, uh, this uh, 21-ish year old man uh, cowered in fear. It was a different time, of course, but he cowered in fear and prayed a prayer to Saint Anne, the patron saint of minors. His dad was a minor. And he prayed a kind of an, an if-then prayer to God. He said, if you will spare me from uh, this th storm, I promise I will enter into the monastery. <clears throat> It's not really a, what we would call a confident prayer. It's a, it's a conditional prayer. If you will do this for me, then I will do this for you. <clears throat> but David's prayer here this, this evening that we're considering in Psalm 6 is very different. David, though he's in the middle of great despair, is filled with confidence and hope. And so uh, we want to examine David's prayer this evening under two headings. First, we're going to look at David's complaint or his his moaning, his groaning in verses 1 through 7. And then we're going to look at David's assurance in verses 8 through 10. So David's complaint in the first seven verses and then David's assurance in verses 8 through 10. So <clears throat> look with me again. Uh, we come to the superscript. It doesn't inform us on much other than the fact that this private prayer is intended for corporate use. It's assigned to the choir master to be sung, a, a prayer uh, sung at, by the congregation, by the choir of the people of God. And David, at the beginning of this prayer, uh, makes an assumption. You can see it in how he speaks uh, of his standing before the Lord. Uh, David makes an assumption that he is, in fact, deserving of God's anger, that he is, in fact, deserving of God's wrath. In this psalm, David will cry out, uh, cry for deliverance to God, uh, but as we have used Job in, in some senses in the past already to show uh, what it means to talk to God respectfully and honorably, uh, David's cry is quite different from Job's. Job, you remember in that book, comes to God and, and he kind of says, well, I, I think I'm getting a, the short end of the stick. I don't think what is happening to me is deserved, and if only I could plead my case to God, I could show to him that what's happening to me is not deserved. And, and David is very different from that. He immediately assumes at the beginning of his prayer <clears throat> that he is not deserving of God's mercy, but that he is instead deserving of God's anger and wrath. David doesn't come to God in this prayer and say, how could you have done this to me? Look at all the good things that I've done in my life. I mean, I, I slew Goliath, this nine-foot uh, giant, and, 
and I wasn't afraid. I trusted in you in those moments. I, I didn't lay a, a hand on Saul. Twice I had the opportunity to slay him and take the throne in my hands for myself, but I, I didn't do that. I, I waited for you. Uh, how can you now turn to me in my distress, in your anger and your wrath? Now, that's not what David says. Instead, his assumption is that he is, in fact, deserving of God's rebuke and anger. He is deserving of God's discipline in wrath. And having set that as the starting point of his prayer in this psalm, he then turns to God and he asks for his favor. He asks for his mercy. In verse 2, be gracious uh, to me. He understands that, that truth that is recorded by Paul in, in the letter of Romans, that all have sinned and fall short of God's glory, that all of us stand guilty in a, in a guilty condition, uh, even as we saw in the Shorter Catechism lesson this evening, that we are deserving of God's wrath, and David is saying to God, be gracious to me, or give me your favor, give me uh, your gift of uh, mercy. David doesn't come uh, presumptuously, presumptuously, but he asks for God's gift. Now we have to understand, of course, that a gift is only a gift when there is no merit attached to it, right? If, if it was something that we had earned, it would no longer be a gift, it would be a wage. And David is asking for God's unmerited favor to be given to him, uh, his gift to be bestowed on him. It's almost like what he had said earlier in Psalm 4, uh, when uh, he asks God to lift up the light of his face upon us. O oh Lord. This is the cry of David. It's repackaged. It's said in a different way here in Psalm 6. He's asking for God's favor to be handed down to him. But there's something that's different in Psalm 6 because in verse 3 you see that David, uh, and we can make an assumption, that David has been making these requests for some time. Uh, he has uh, set his prayer before the Lord and, and he's waiting now. Uh, he's waiting so much that in his despair, he, he kind of stops his thoughts halfway through a sentence. And he says, but you, O Lord, and he stops and he says, how long? Uh, he is like the man straining uh, for the day to break when he is a watchman on the wall. He is waiting for, that, for that, that light to come up over the horizon. And that's where David is. David is in trouble. He is languishing and he is asking the Lord how long he must wait in this trouble of his soul. He has, he has suffered. He has been in, in, in disharmony. And yet he waits for the Lord. And the Lord doesn't seem to be responding to his requests at all. And as David continues to pour out his lament before the Lord, he gives us some clues as to what's happening. David is in a condition, in a position, where he is actually fearing uh, for his life. He says in verse 4, deliver my life. Uh, so he, in his despair, appeals to God for his deliverance. This ought not to be a surprise to us. I mean, uh, think of uh, people who claim no faith in God at all, no belief in God at all, and yet when they are in a moment of crisis, even as we uh, pray together in our, in our congregational prayer this evening, in crisis many people will turn and at least superficially cry out to God in some shape or form, or, or maybe they will find somebody who they know is religious and ask them to pray instead of them. I, I don't pray, but would you pray for me because I'm, I'm going through uh, this hardship? Uh, we've seen this illustrated in our own nation. On, on uh, September 11, 2001, there was a, a shocking event that took place in our nation when, when air, two airplanes flew into the Twin Towers in New York City. It was a time of great instability in our land. It was a time of great uncertainty. And uh, as that uncertainty kind of covered this nation like a blanket, there was interesting things that happened. Uh, Barna, the Christian number crunchers, they said that uh, commitments to local churches and Bible sa sales immediately skyrocketed as people uh, in uncertainty turned to the Lord for deliverance, for some sense of security, for some sense of safety. It wasn't long-lived, of course, but even people who don't believe in God will turn to Him in moments of crisis. So if that is true of, of those who have no relationship with God at all, if even the rebel seeks God 
in times of trouble, how much more should his children uh, do so? And that's what uh, David does here. David turns to the Lord. Uh, you remember when God's name is recorded that way, it's the Hebrew word Yahweh. It's God's covenant keeping, His relational name with His people. It's the name uh, that the people of Israel cry out to when they are in distress because the Lord is their God. He said, I will be your God and you will be uh, my people. It is to, in this sense, in this identity that David cries out uh, to the God of covenant relationship and asks Him uh, to deliver him. And we notice again, as we have seen in other places in the Psalms, David doesn't turn to God asking him to deliver him for anything that he has accomplished, but he turns to God asking for God to remember him for the sake of his steadfast love. Uh, this love that is unshakable. Uh, this unshakable commitment that God has to fulfill his promises regardless of our unfaithfulness or regardless of David's unfaithfulness. And so David is asking for deliverance. He's asking for salvation. And that implies in itself an understanding that he knows he is not deserving of it. If you had to ask for something, it is not yours by right. If David thought he was deserving of it, he would simply demand it. But he doesn't demand it. He asks for it. And so, uh, as David doesn't rest on his own achievement, this deliverance is not even done uh, for David, but it is done for the Lord. And we see that in verse 5. David, in seeking his deliverance, is asking for it so that God's name would continue to be praised in his, his own life, in his physical body. In verse 5 it says, For in death there is no remembrance of, me, of you. In Sheol, who will give you praise? David wants to continue to worship God here on this earth, and it forms the foundation of his prayer. He doesn't want God to deliver him so that he can have more family and fun, but he asks for it so that he would continue in worship. Now, I want to understand a little bit what David is saying here when he talks about Sheol and that in death there is no remembrance of him. This whole idea of Sheol, uh, Sheol is a word that's used 65 times uh, in the Old Testament. It is a uh, description, a descriptive wor word, has three main uses. Uh, sometimes it's used to describe the actual place of damnation, what we would consider hell. Sometimes it's used to describe uh, extreme distress and anguish, as we would use it in the creed when we talk about he descended into hell. And other times, almost exclusively, this word sheol equals the grave or it equals death. And we can see it in several places. Let me just give one example to us this evening in Habakkuk. Chapter 2, verse 5, it says, uh, uh, Moreover, wine is a traitor, an arrogant man uh, who is never at rest. His greed is as wide as Sheol, like death he, ha he has never enough. And that's the sense that Sheol is often used in Old Testament literature. That combination of Sheol with death, putting them side by side, uh, using Sheol and death as synonyms, both of them describing the condition of death or uh, or the grave. And that's in fact how it's used here. Uh, for in death there is no remembrance of you, in Sheol who will give you praise. This is a common, almost exclusive use of that word in the Old Testament. Sheol equals death, Sheol equals the grave. And so what David is saying here uh, in this verse is that when the body is placed in the grave, when the soul exits the body, that body is still. Now, God is still glorified in the heavenly places, but that body itself no longer worships God. It is simply a body which will decay, waiting for it to be rejoined to the soul when Christ comes again. So in Sheol, or in the grave, the body doesn't praise God. In fact, when we see a dead body, it's a reminder of God's judgment uh, rather than something uh, that would cause... The, the, the body is not praising God, it is, a rem is, is reminding us of the judgment that is coming to mankind because of sin. And so in death, the guilt of man before God is highlighted. And David is asking that God would grant him his requests so that he would continue to worship him in body and soul here and now. Now, uh, David d doesn't leave things there. He continues on to describe 
the depth of his sorrow in this psalm. And you see that in verses 6 and 7, some beautiful poetic language. Uh, This past week, uh, I was on a home visit and I was asking the children of of the family who we were visiting what their favorite part of the Bible was. And and, and these people said that the book of Psalms uh, was their favorite part of the Bible. And when I asked the, the children, the children said this, which caught me by surprise, and I asked them, why is the book of Psalms your favorite book? And they said, because the language that is used in there is so uh, beautiful. It's so rich. It's so poetic and, and deep. And, and these are two of those verses uh, that certainly are like that. When we, when we think about the Psalms and we see uh, the, it's different from an epistle. It's different from a historical account, which are, are more clinical and clean. But, but here the, the poetry, the, the, the cry of David's heart really can come out. And he describes it for us uh, beautifully, his despair. He says in verse 6 that he is weary with moaning. He is exhausted. He has suffered so much that his groaning, the oppression of his circumstance, has caused him to become uh, exhausted. It weighs on him so heavily that it, sa- it saps all his physical strength. He says, every night I flood my bed with tears. I flood my, my bed with tears. He's is, he is distraught. He's weeping night after night after night. You know, the, the Hebrew, uh, it's almost a, a comical picture. In the Hebrew, when you see, every night I flood my bed with tears, if you were to translate it literally, it says, every night I make my bed swim. And that's the literal translation. It's, it's the picture of, of the room filling up with David's tears and, and the bed becomes a raft. That's how much uh, David is weeping. He weeps night in and night out and he is exhausted as a result of it. Then he says that he drenches his couch with his weeping. Now, again... If you look at the literal Hebrew, it's a, a, more power, a more powerful description. It says, I cause my couch to dissolve. Uh, this is, uh, I don't know if you've ever, well, I'm, I'm sure we've all done it. You, you dump the ice cubes in the sink and you pour water on it. And when the water hits that ice cube, it, it disappears because the water uh, dissolves the ice cube. Uh, so it's the same thing that David is saying, my tears are so many that they are dissolving my couch. Uh, This is a description of the depth of the despair that David finds himself in. It is complete. It's not just David's had a bad day. Uh, David, things didn't work for David at the office today. This is day after day, hardship upon hardship, causing this man, this king, to be completely exhausted. And in verse 7 It's affecting his physical health even. It says uh, that his eye wastes away because of grief. And he grows weak because of all his foes. I don't know, it's hard to imagine now, but you remember those days in the summer when you forget to water your flowers on the front porch. And you get out there at 3 o'clock in the afternoons and the the flowers, they're they're struggling, right? They're they're wilting. They're, They're wasting away in the heat of the day. Uh, they begin to droop. Or maybe if you're applying it to a person, uh, picture uh, those images, those horrifying images of of people coming out of the concentration camps after Second World War. They're wasted away. Their bodies are are gaunt. They, they, They have no health in them anymore. This is the effect of David's sorrow on him. This sorrow that he's been facing day after day. It's Uh, causing his eyes to waste away and he grows weak because of all his foes. The eye that used to look out for relief as David scanned the horizon for God's deliverance uh, now has become weak. He wants to see hope, but one enemy after another has obscured his view. He has become discouraged. Uh, Even in the midst of his discouragement, though he keeps his eyes fixed unwaveringly on the horizon, the tears flow over his eyes and they cloud his vision. This is the complaint of David. This is David pouring out his soul to God saying, O Lord, deliver me. This is my condition. 
Then we come to the last part of the psalm, and we look in verses 8 through 10 of, at uh, David's assurance. And it's a curious turn of events, isn't it? I mean, the first seven verses of this psalm, you think David's about to, about to fall apart. Everything is going to disintegrate for him, and he's, he's going to be a mess for years to come. But then after he pours out his heart to God, in verse 8 he says, Depart from me, all you workers of evil, for the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. There is a tremendous confidence. Not only uh, in the, is he in the middle of despair, but after he has said his prayer, he turns to his enemies, in a sense, and he says to them, Watch out. I've prayed, and I know that the Lord will hear my prayer. Instead of despair, he entrusts himself to God, and he is so sure of it that he is able to verbally warn uh, his enemies. He does that in verse 9. He continues that confidence. The Lord has heard my prayer, prayer my plea. The Lord accepts my prayer. It's not, the, you better be careful because the Lord might hear my prayer. The Lord might hear my plea. There is a certainty in David and in his speaking. He knows it for certain and he entrusts himself uh, to God. And David then, as if turning back to us, says, all my enemies will, shall be ashamed and greatly troubled. They shall turn back and be put to shame in a moment. David describes in advance the downfall of his enemies. Their lot will be shame, trouble, defeat, and humiliation. Now that is true for David in, in a sense of the physical realm. But it's also true uh, for us as Christians. If David had confidence in his uh, dimmed understanding of all that God would do, how much more should we? We have seen the glory of God uh, fulfilled on the cross. We have seen the Christ raised from the dead. We have uh, read the words of, of Paul that if we are buried with him, that we also will live with him. Now, these things are set before us, promises that David only had in shadow form. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, a, a, pass, a, a book of the Bible that we have been uh, referring to a, a lot lately, speaks of the reign of Christ over all things. It says there, He must reign until He has put all His enemies under His feet. That is the promise that Christ has given to us. That He will put everything under His, under his feet, Christ will. All His enemies. Now who are the enemies? Do we have people chasing us around who are causing us to make our beds float and dissolve our beds with tears? Well, we have uh, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Now, these are the enemies of the people of God. And they will be destroyed at the second coming. Uh, for David, his enemies may seem victorious for a time, uh, but we know the final result. Uh, we may look around in our circumstances and think whatever is going to happen, but we know the final result. We know that the world, the flesh, and the devil, death and Hades will be thrown into the lake of fire, as we read in Revelation chapter 20. So from this psalm of David, where he begins with great complaint and ends with great confidence, several, several things that I think we can learn from it. First of all, there's a, an implicit charge for the people of God here in Psalm 6 to bring your requests to God in prayer. How often do we neglect prayer? When we are in sin, maybe it's a, a besetting sin, a sin that we fail in repeatedly. Uh, maybe it is a time of great discouragement. Maybe we're in the middle of grief. Maybe we are in a time of great sorrow. Maybe we say to ourselves, God doesn't care, He cannot love me. But David in this prayer gives us a very different picture. In the depths of his sorrow, he cries out to God, and we ought to do the same. Pray to the Lord, even if your tears would flood your bed. A second thing that I think we can learn is confidence from prayer. If David, in the middle of his grief, could be so confident, how much more could we? Our concerns in God's sight are really rather small, aren't they? 
They're rather insignificant when you think of who we are praying to. When we pray, do we know that we, do we remember, we know it, but do we remember that we're praying to the God of hev- who made heaven and earth? Do we remember that? Just think about the sun, not, not the biological sun or the eternal sun, but the sun that we see in the sky, the sun that warms our planet. Let me tell you a couple of things about the sun. Uh, its diameter is 109 times that of the earth. So that's kind of hard to imagine, but imagine you had a line that was 100 feet long, and that would be the sun, and then you take one of your little feet That's the size of the earth compared to the sun. The sun is so large, in fact, that it makes up 99.86% of all the mass in our solar system. The sun. The sun produces more energy in one second than a billion cities do in a year. This is the sun. You know how long it took God to make the sun? Now put your problem next to the sun and see if you think that God would not be able to help you in your hardship, to help you in your time of distress, to help you in your uh, supposed need, no matter how desperate it may seem uh, to you. God speaks and the sun becomes. He certainly is able to deal with us in our troubles, in our sorrows. And the third thing I think that we learn is to be accepting of God's answer to us in prayer. It is, of course, possible that we do not pray according to God's will. We know that God answers us when we pray according to His will, but if we pray in a way that is not according to His will, God will not answer or grant us our request. Now, it is natural for us as people when we come to those times of Uh, refusal from God, that we would begin to complain, that we would begin to grumble. But the question that we have to ask ourselves is, is God able to deliver us from our enemies uh, better than we are? In other words, does God know what is best for you? Do you trust God to know what is best for you? And is God able to give what is best for you? And in in that sense, we can accept God's answers in our prayers. We ought not to turn and question Him when things don't go our our way, but instead when prayer is offered, uh, we can return to joyful service of God because we know that He can do and that He does do those things which are good uh, for His people, truly good for His people. So in David's prayer in, in Psalm 6, he He essentially says that even though he might despair, yet he will trust in the God of heaven and earth who will hear me. It's a a prayer of assurance that David utters. It doesn't seem to start out that way. But in the final analysis, David has great confidence in the might and power of God to deliver him even though he is not deserving. And that assurance ought to belong to each of us as well. We, as God's people, gathered here tonight, when we face the hardships each day, uh, we can be confident that there is a Heavenly Father who hears our prayers. And not only is that an idea, not only is that uh, something that we can pay vague intellectual assent to, this is something that is true, people of God. You can be certain of it. Let's pray together.